streaming, and that's why we're using the microphones. I promise not to shout, even, even, even though I feel like shouting today. Um, we were hoping to have Matt, have Matt Smriga from the IFO office, but he couldn't make it down due to weather. Um, so we have me, Mary Visser, and Greg Marg is going to be fielding questions from people that might be watching this online and uh, asking questions. And then we have our negotiator, Dan Crone Mills, who helped to get this contract for us. And as I sent out a message earlier, we will answer questions until there are no other questions to be answered. We did at our earlier meeting today get into a bit of uh, Minnesota State gossip and other things like that. We will not try to get into gossip again if we can avoid it. But the purpose is to talk about our proposed contract ratification. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it over to Dan so that Greg can field questions if they come in. Dan, as a negotiator, has all of the answers. And I'm just going to sit over there and away from the camera and try to look pretty. <laughs> You've seen the information that's been sent out numerous times on the contract settlement. So rather than walk through all of that again, unless you really want that, do you have questions about the new language that's being implemented or the economic package or anything else? We've got some beautiful handouts. Yes, sir. Oh, hold it. Where's the, where's the mic? Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> it, it, the answer to my question is probably buried in all the stuff somewhere that I didn't read. Okay. But uh, with the longevity bumps, um, oh, yeah. the 17 and the 25, um, when things become ratified, signed, passed, done, uh, when does all of this take effect? Is it as of the beginning of this, this academic year, or does it begin from the point like next fall. career step accelerators are in the yeah. second year of the contract okay so they would be implemented next fall fall if uh, you meet the yep yeah the right requirements okay. right so now that we've moved to the 17 and 25 25 as opposed to 20 and 30 is that suggestive that we're probably not going to go back to 20 and 30? Because otherwise, someone could go for their 17, and then if it got bought back to the 20, they could go for the 20, too. No, I'm sure, one, if we did that, the system office would make sure to block that okay. kind of double dipping. Um, and we pushed hard to get these career step accelerators moved even up more. So, I, so we would fight hard against drifting back the other direction. Okay. If anything, we'd want to, we want to keep pushing them even earlier and earlier. Anything to help salary compression? You bet. Since we're talking about career steps, the so first question I received was about them as well, so I thought I would ask it right away. And basically, it's uh, um, so this is for the next contract, the 18 fiscal year 1819 contract, and it's in the second year. And they were concerned what might happen in 2021 if we don't settle the contract, are they automatically implemented then, or uh, do they go away, or whatever? I think I know the answer, but yeah, I will go get... Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> if, if the contract isn't ratified by the Faculty Association... Next, the next contract you're talking about. Oh, the next contract. Yeah. So if this one is ratified, but the next one... But the next one isn't settled for some reason. They want to know... In then, we are work oh, then we are working on a dead contract, but all the language and conditions in the current contract still apply. So as I understand it, if it's the next contract, you, those steps would still be triggered. Anybody? Anybody? Or I'll start singing, and that will be worse. Do we have a timeline? Oh, non-friend geography. Do we have a timeline yet for our IFO members ratification and then what calendaring might look like uh, after our ratification election and so on. You mean in terms of, we do have, sorry. Yeah, when do we vote? And we, we do vote, we have a final meeting on Monday at from one to two. We are required to have two meetings, we have had four. Okay. And we had definitely one we wanted to stream so that other people that were not on campus could get it. The ballots will be sent out to your home on near the 1st of February, and then you will have, I believe, until the 9th to cast wow. your ballot. Okay. And it is really, really important to vote. Oh, wow. 
I will. Yes, I know you will, but I would <laughs> encourage other people to vote too because it's really a sign of uh, how interested we are in this. And sure. we don't take the good contracts for granted. We need to support them. And so, and we have a number of elections coming up this spring, yeah. which I think you're aware of, and we'll have a, a timeline calendar for all of those. But yeah. we'll finish our, our last meeting, and then the deadline, if you're not a full share member to join, is next Tuesday yeah. to be able to vote on the contract. Because again, you have to be a full member, right. a member of the union. So in an optimistic timeline, if, our ratification election, if you will, closes on the 9th of February. Right. Uh, roughly, what does the timeline look like for it all to move forward and to finally be implemented? The, the Board of Trustees has already indicated that they're going to call a special meeting just to vote on the contract also so they can weigh in, which means then the next step is the legislature and it's at their discretion when they pick it up and who they get to carry it to the floor and all of that kind of fun stuff. Um, my guess is it'll be a part of package of all of the rest of the union contracts. Um, but I do know that um, the community college, community and technical college faculty contract, when we settled, they hadn't even met since the summer. So they're way behind us. So they, it might go to the legislature without theirs as part of the package. Um, but we're hoping that in this next session it'll get picked up bundled with all the rest of the contracts and brought to the floor for a vote. Well, let me be, just, um, first I'll correct the dates. We start voting on the 9th and then it closes on the 16th of Thank February. Uh, and then the other thing I was going to say is traditionally this is one of the bargaining chips in legislation, so it really doesn't get accepted by the legislature till very close to the end, which means it'll be May before uh, it'll be right. settled, and then we would have back pay for this year's year. activities. All right. Can I uh, change a little bit? It's still about the contract, but not about our contract specifically. Uh, the CGIP healthcare, and I know that we have what we have at the moment, uh, but that the, the legislature chose not to go with all the newly bargained things or went with some of them. Is there any movement on that uh, going with, you know, the, the entire full package of new stuff or only the partial package? All the health care stuff is done in coalition bargaining right with there. all of the unions together, um, with, the, with the state, basically. Yes, um, I know. And so that's still part of the package. That hasn't been modified or changed. That's still sitting there. It just requires the legislature to, to vote it in. So it hasn't been changed, but it's, it hasn't been implemented because the legislature didn't vote on it yet. The subcommittee voted it down, but not the full legislature. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm wondering. Where is that in the process? So it'll move along with the rest of the contracts. Okay. So it won't, it won't move independently. So it's, it's tied to our contracts when they go up. Got it. Yep. So we just wait. When our contract gets ratified by the legislature, then these would get implemented at the same time. We think. We hope. We hope. Okay, yeah. thank you. That's what I was wondering about the, okay. the CGIP thing. Thanks. Other questions? Are you pretty happy with the nature of the contract? Yes. Thank you. Stroking my own ego a little bit here for some gratification. <laughs> Just. Uh, just wondering if um, there's time between now and the election for non-full members to sign up to join. Mary's jumping at the I, Yeah, to No, they can, up until next Tuesday, they can join. Okay. So if they're a non-member, they can join and they will be able to vote. But just remember what the process is. The process is to go online to ifo.org and you can just simply sign up through the website. And we'll get a list of those folks, and our ballot company will be able to send ballots out to them. If anybody doesn't get a ballot, then they need to let us know, and we'll contact the IFO office. Um, there was something else I was going to say about the full share members. Oh, remember now, too, that when somebody becomes a member, there is a window of opportunity to drop out. 
and that window is in late spring, early summer. But once you become a member, you stay a member until you opt out. So it used to be that people could come in and out whenever they wanted, and that's not how it works. I do want to remember, remind people, too, that the difference between a full share and a fair share is about a cup of really nice coffee a week. You know, it's not that much more. And we will really feel strongly, though I am biased, that it is important to, to vote, uh, to be able to vote, to be able to serve on committees, to do other things, uh, and be a full share member to do that. So I'll get off my stump here. Oh, you did get a note today about upcoming campus elections, too. So. We are looking for candidates for some important positions, and we hope that you'll either consider running or nominating somebody else to serve in that role. OK, we have an online question. I'm new to this process. As I saw in the reading, pay raises are retroactive to fall 2017. But if we have to wait until all the bargaining units have completed theirs, could we potentially get both the 2017 and 2018 pay raises at the same time? And tell Danny did a great job. <laughs> that's in there. I didn't make that up. Um, <laughs> just reading the whole thing. The, the answer is yes. And you would get retroactive for the, the 1.6 for 2017. You'd get retroactive pay. But they might all be implemented at the same time, depending on. Because even after the legislature votes, it takes HR a while to get everything lined up and figure out what all the things are and, and trigger them and all of that kind of fun stuff. And so it's you might get one month of the 2017 before the 2018 kicks in along with the retroactive. It depends on how fast HR and the legislature and all of that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Oh, I should have looked at the camera for that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And viewing in the comfort of their home. Absolutely. Don Fran, geography again. I do not have a question. I want to say thank you to all of the IFO and the FAA for all the print or all the written materials regarding the results of this have been wonderful. I mean, this is why I have very few questions because it's been very clear what you guys have put out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I? And I'll make sure to, or Mary will make sure to pass that on to the I will to John, too. but I do want to say that a lot of this better communication has come from our government relations, uh, IFO government relations person, John Bone, and he not only negotiates for us, which is a really important role at the state level, but he's our director of communications. We also have Aaron Deliktoff, who is our kind of office manager, uh, technician, technical guy, and he's just done an amazing job streamlining some of the processes at our office. I mean, we are very, very concerned about spending um, your dues wisely with what we do. And I think we've become very economical. Uh, we've gotten a lot more green in the office. And we've gotten a lot better at getting meaningful co communications out to the members. And that's through John. So he does a wonderful job for us. Can't say enough about him. Is there more? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got a question. Yeah, Diane. I know you don't need this, but here it goes. That's okay. <laughs> um, I'm asking a question for some of our junior faculty, primarily in our department. It's about the um, criterion, and there were some added bullet points in criterion two. Oh, in Appendix G? Appendix G. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I had a preliminary conversation with someone in our department who's, you know, um, we have a very hard working group of people, some of whom are work tirelessly, say, for example, on assessment. And would that fall under this uh, playbook and coaching? Man I mean, I was led to believe that there were more bullet points that would clarify some, like, I write our accreditation report. I've done it for the 30-some years I've been here. I've written four of them. I've never used them as part of my um, publication needs. 
haven't needed it. But we're being pushed to do so much that I think the next generation of people coming in need to get credit for that kind of hard work. Is that what this is telling me? Uh, Appendix G is just uh, an example list. It's not all inclusive. Okay. So it doesn't mean that because it's not on Appendix G, it doesn't count. But we keep trying to find ways to put more stuff into that to give people an appropriate credit or to look and say, well, this is on the list. This is what I was looking at, you know, so that they have something to fall back on. And the coaches, one of the reasons the coaches part was included in there is most of the coaches don't do traditional kinds of conference papers and research mm -hmm. in that regard. But they do spend a lot of time researching and developing their, their playbooks and all of their other materials. And it's hard work. Um, and so we tried to get that in there so they had some specific language to fall back on for that criterion too. So they could say, this is what so, I developed, this is what I provided, these, you know, because that. So if someone had an idea, it, it, I mean, we, you know, we are doing assessment reports beyond assessment reports in this day and age. And for that individual that is tasked with that, who writes a report at the end of every year, would that be an example that needs to be added to a? Well, I, I don't think this is an exclusive list. Okay. I think the other thing is that if you create a professional development plan that includes whatever that is as part of the criteria, it is accepted. A supported by your department, it's supported by your uh, by your uh, supervisor, your dean. Then I don't think that you have a problem, and you should get credit. And I was going to make it as you know, kind of an aside. Probably you don't need that, Diane, because of your other accomplishments. But I think there are faculty that that should be getting credit for that important work that they do, mm -hmm. and they should include it. But it it needs to be part of their plans and their reports, and it would be based on what the dean would want them to be doing too. No, that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, because in many instances, junior faculty are resistant to taking on that because they're afraid of losing the time that otherwise they would commit exactly. towards research and conference and publications. And so there has to be a balance between that if we expect them to take on those responsibilities and duties. And you're right, we have more and more and more of those all of the time. Yeah. Can I say one more and the thing about the coaches, and I that I don't think has been as problematic, but in the olden days, and you and I remember those, and you may not have been aware of it, but uh, we had previous athletic directors, they didn't do any real evaluation of the coaches whatsoever. And I know on some other campuses that they, they're totally behind on their PDPs, PDRs, they just don't get evaluated as they should be. This just gives them some additional things, because obviously if I'm gonna be functioning as a coach, the, those type of skills are things that are going to make me successful. Therefore, I can get a pay increase. There's got to be something that people are, um, you know, able to be evaluated on other than just wins and losses. Though we all know that wins and losses are important, but, you know, there has to be other things. So I think we've really tried to reach out to the coaches. Uh, our lead negotiator is a former coach from uh, Southwest Missouri, uh, Missouri, <laughs> Minnesota. Sorry. We've expanded the... In Missouri, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, my Kansas upbringing is getting in the way here. Um, so I think what we want to do is make it possible to evaluate, because I do think they need to be held to standards. They are a member of our bargaining unit. We want them to be more vocal members of our bargaining unit. We want them to be in more involved members, and traditionally they haven't. So this is a... We're trying to reach out to the coaches. We're trying to reach out to our adjuncts, and I think uh, our newer faculty with the with the... Uh, hasten to career steps. So we're trying to put things out for people that we that haven't in times felt as part of the contract as other people have. Yeah. So well, I, I actually think this, you know, for whomever it benefits is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, because it, as you were saying, Dan, new p people come on, they don't want to take on this accreditation responsibility. And who's going to do it? Exactly. Who's going to do it when I leave? That's right. And it, Incentive, that's not good. Yeah, no, I agree. Can you talk a little bit, Dan, about some of the adjunct faculty benefits? Um, I'm going to give this back to you. Sure. Um, they got a boost in pay, just like all faculty did. One of the things that Minsky tries to do it sometimes is, is pit different factions of faculty against each other. Well, we'll give all of the continuing full-time faculty this, and they'll sort of 
forget about adjuncts. So we work hard to make sure that across the board, everybody's being treated appropriately and that we're not forgetting about contingent faculty and adjunct faculty and fixed term, et cetera, et cetera, across the board. One of the nice things that we did add this time around, which we've never had before, is they now have, uh, adjuncts have professional development funds. Previously, if they wanted to go to a conference, it was either beg and plead and hope for the graciousness of some department from their own budget or the dean to fund it or just pay for it out of their own pocket. Now there's a pocket of, it's not huge, but there's a pocket of money that will be distributed among the seven universities and then we'll have to come up internally with standards and guidelines for how they would apply for those funds. Um, which could be good. We, there was just somebody in my own department, an adjunct, who approached our department and said, can I get funding to attend this conference? And there's nothing in the contract for them. So it's all at the, the graciousness of the faculty and the dean, which is... Oh yeah, and then the, the credit hours have gone up for adjuncts from 10 to 12, which creates a nice balance because if, you, if you're in the three credit, you can't max out the nine. You, and if you're in the four credit base, you can't, max out, you can't get max out the 10. So by 12, it gives an even balance. You can max out those numbers. You can make best use of your adjuncts and all of those kind of fun things. And healthcare. And healthcare. Um, and if they teach 12 credits, at that point, they're also eligible and will get uh, benefits, health care benefits will trigger at that point. The, the tricky part is it triggers at the point when they're actually teaching the 12 credits. So if they're teaching eight in the fall, no benefits, they pick up another four credit class in the spring semester, at that point on the first duty day when classes start, bingo, then they get benefits. Um, I believe I read this correctly. that. Um, the uh, professional development funds were separated between the other institutions and then Metro. That Metro had a separate line? Metro, Metro has sections in the contract that are unique for them. And it is an interesting point of contention because they have that big pocket of community faculty. And so they have special pockets of money to try to support those community faculty, but not quite at the same levels and et cetera, et cetera. So they're, yeah, they're in kind of a different boat. And it takes you forever to wade through it, and then Metro screws it up. Oh, anyway. I didn't say that. That would have been gossip. That, that's just unreported fake news. <laughs> Other questions? Remember, when you get your back pay, 10% goes to the negotiator. <laughs> I really got to get that language in the contract. <laughs> or assessment of his job, just drop. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I would just echo, thank you very much. It's a tireless, tireless work. It's appreciated. Yeah. One thing I would, would mention is coming up this spring, we have delegate assembly. And one of the things that's done at delegate assembly is we review, we discuss, and we vote on new resolutions for what we want to argue to go into the next contract. So if there are things that you would like added, deleted, revised, edited in the contract, then you really want to participate in that process. One, if you can, go to the delegate assembly. But two, fill out the... Can I borrow that? You bet. It's March 23rd and 24th, and I'm getting, I've meant to get something out each day, but each day has brought a different challenge. Uh, to, so I expect to get it out tomorrow. Um, we pay mileage, we pay more mileage if you bring somebody with you. So if you carpool, um, we will uh, pick up double rooms on Friday night. So it's a Thursday, Friday. Some of us have Friday, to be up. Saturday. Friday, Saturday, excuse me. It starts Friday morning and ends on Saturday. Some campuses are paying for people to go down Thursday, but it's close enough. We don't start till 10.30 or 11 or later. So it's- a long haul from MIT. It is a long haul or Moorhead. But for us, we'll do that. Uh, we did find out that there are some other options available. Uh, so if there is a necessity for some reason that somebody has to have a single room, 
um, we will consider that request. But it needs to go to Donna, uh, Donna, it needs to go to Sue on a first come, first serve basis. Um, we'd like to have fill our full slot of 41 delegates. There's actually 45 of us, but it includes the four IFO board members, me and the, the board reps. Uh, so we will be up there Thursday and Friday night. We'll, we have IFO meetings before that. So I really want to do fill the, fill the slots, and we have one, um, oh gosh, inner, somebody that comes in and sits down if you have to get up and go to another meeting. So well, we have alternate. An, uh, alternate, I couldn't <laughs> think of the word. Anyway, we'll pay one alternate to go up there and be available, but it really makes a difference to have our full company, and it was pretty rollicking the last time. <laughs> it's usually very fun. The meals are all catered. Um, we have social events in the evening. Great opportunity for networking with your colleagues across the system, and they usually have a pretty good party, you know, parties of different sorts. So uh, do let Sue know if you're interested, and I really, if you do sign up, make a commitment to go. You know, 10 million things get in the way of, of this, but I really think it helps you to understand how we make decisions. And the parental leave, which is something that was a big deal that we, that was a delegate assembly resolution. You know, a lot of the good things that have come in the contract, uh, have, well, they have to come out of the delegate assembly because that's what guides are. That's the only place we take them from. Yeah, so they can't make up their own stuff about what they want to go into the contract, like that 10% crap mm -hmm. uh, for the negotiators. <laughs> Uh, yes, good. Uh, and we are going to have we are going to have resolution writing workshops. So we'll be announcing those. Barbara Carson has agreed to to do those along with um, Bobby Bothman and um, who else? Donna Casella. So we'll have resolutions coming forward, and then we'll kind of sort those out. So if there's competing ones from different campuses that are the same, we'll just make sure that one goes forward. So do come to the delegate assembly. Uh, we had Keith Ellison come last time. I think Lori Swanson was there. I wouldn't be surprised if Tim Waltz didn't come, but we're kind of used to seeing him around here anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But still, uh, and I think you are aware that we have endorsed him as our candidate for governor. Uh, so we've gone out a bit, I don't think a bit on a limb. I think he's a good candidate, and I'm very pleased that we did endorse him. But um, anyway, so any questions about delegate assembly? 23rd, 24th, and again, it's a, f a fun place to be and a lot of things going on. Yeah. When will you, when will you put out the call for resolutions? To, uh, I'll put that out with a call tomorrow. Okay. And so we are going to do them with an organized fashion. We've got the forms in the office, but we'd like to make sure that they're done correctly. They're not rocket science, and you may have done it before, Don. Yeah, so other questions about delegate? I would just comment, the last delegate assembly, the contingent faculty were well organized coming and they brought forward a few things, some of which were accomplished as a result of their influence. And so it, the negotiators are pretty good about working on some of those things, especially if it doesn't cost anything. I'm sorry. So if you want to change some of the stuff in Appendix G, if you'd like other things to be broadened or put in there, this is where it all comes from. So it's an opportunity for people. I. I listen to people a lot. We do have a general meeting coming up on the 31st, uh, our okay. spring meeting. And so I have a lot of people that stand up and say, well, I think you should do this. And it's like, you know what? I think you should do this. And put your money where your mouth is. Come and vote. Come and, come and you know, help shape our future. Uh, and you can do that as eas not as easily, but because I get paid for this a little bit. But you know, you can do it too, and it makes a stronger stronger thing and especially for young faculty I think it's really important to see how we do business and it's most of it isn't shocking some of it is but it's mostly really fun and interesting and it's very unique and it just helps us be the kind of strong group uh, and the group that gets a good contract better than our colleagues at non-union places so <laughs> Nothing else online. Okay. Anybody? So we're not getting any more questions, and as advertised. Good.
yeah, we're, we're going to sign off now. So Greg will still take additional questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, thank you for coming today. And thank you if you're online. Um, and get in touch with us if you have additional questions.